Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for the eighth webinar in our series on ethics in COVID-19 on behalf of the George Washington University's Milken Institute School of Public Health um, and our Office of Research and Bioethics Interest Group. I uh, welcome you. My name is Adnan Haider. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Research, a Professor of Global Health and uh, <clears throat> direct the Office of Research and co-chair the Bioethics Interest Group as well. I'm really excited about our webinar today. It's on a fundamentally important issue in public health in general, which is the issue of violence affecting families and members who are uh, intimate or close relationship with each other, called family violence, domestic violence, often intimate partner violence. Um, but our experts today will clarify some of these issues for us. Not only is this a critical issue uh, both in domestic public health, but also as a global public health issue where violence and violence prevention activities are a critical part of global public health. But today, we have unfortunately seen a rise in this incidence and perpetration of uh, domestic and family violence related to the current pandemic. In some ways, the pandemic of COVID-19 has unveiled other epidemics and pandemics in our society as well. And I'm excited that two of my colleagues, um, both with affiliation from George Washington University, uh, are, are joining us today. Um, and they have an expertise on different aspects of this. And I look forward to having a conversation with them around ethics, COVID, and domestic violence. Please remember, if you're a student and you want your professional education credit, uh, my colleague Michelle will be posting it online. Uh, we'll be giving you instructions in the chat board. Also, um, please note that this webinar is recorded. Uh, the website for that recording will also be posted on the chat board. So uh, that will hopefully help you in uh, moving ahead uh, with your education or, or forwarding it to others who may be not present today. So let me get started by, by welcoming our first panelist, uh, Professor Joan Meyer. Uh, Professor Meyer is Professor of Clinical Law and Director of the National Family Violence Law Center what an appropriate center for today at George Washington University's law school. She's been, of course, a professor of law for um, uh, many years, uh, but, but frankly has really led programs related to family violence and domestic violence uh, for many, many years. She's uh, an expert. She's actually briefed uh, various court decisions, including Supreme Court decisions, um, and her studies have been widely quoted. So I'm very excited, Joan, to not only welcome you today, but um, also hear your opening comments. Uh, Michelle will facilitate that with, uh, with your slides, uh, but over to you, Michelle, to uh, uh, take us through your perspectives on uh, this topic. Thank you so much, Adnan and Michelle, for, for your introduction and your help. Um, I just wanna add one thing to the introduction, which is that the National Family Violence Law Center is, at, is technically called the National Family Violence Law Center at GW because I am required to give that, put that in the name because it really is at GW, a new center here at the, at, at the law school and at the university. Very excited about it. And thank you for the invitation to, to present today. It's, a, it's an important, very important topic. And I appreciated your saying that it is one of several pandemics that are becoming clearer in, in light of COVID-19 because uh, the, the the data on domestic violence shows that one in four women is going to be the victim of domestic violence at some time in her life. One in 10 men, by the way. Um, I'm sure Nicole will be able to give you more numbers on children. Um, it, is, it is a pandemic and COVID-19 is making it far, far worse. Uh, if you wanna go ahead, Michelle, to the next slide. So um, I'm, in my short time, I'm gonna talk about two key points. One is that the increases in family violence and actually, I'm really just talking about partner violence. Nicole is going to talk more about child abuse. Um, and then the second thing, which I think has been less discussed or written about, is what's going on for parents who are sharing custody. Many of those parents involve a perpetrator and a victim, which is not always acknowledged by the courts. Uh, but, but let's go on to the next slide, and I'll move into the, the numbers. So what we know, and it's not just being isolated at home, it's also being in crisis and the stresses that come from crisis. 
stress is including lose, loss of job, you know, struggle to stay afloat financially and physically. Um, these, we've seen this with Hurricane Sandy, we've seen this with a lot of different crises, that domestic violence uh, explodes uh, when there are these kind of major social upheavals and, and physical upheavals in the, in the culture. Um, so uh, it's been interesting to watch the data gathering around uh, the, the world, there's been a lot more data in other countries than the US, interestingly, but what a number of countries, including China and France and other countries have documented was uh, increases of calls to police from up, up to 30% or more, calls to hotlines and to other programs that support survivors up to 100%, a wide range between those two figures, but huge increases in um, the US. Uh, some hotlines have shown increased calls, some hotlines have shown less calls. There's one explanation for that being that if women have less privacy and less ability to make confidential calls because their abuser is nearby, they're calling less in some cases. Those hotlines that have a texting option are really critical in today's day and age where women may not be able to speak out loud but may be able to text for help. Um, the UN Population Fund has predicted that if the lockdown continued for six months, when we're almost, what are we on? month, almost month five now, I think, uh, 31 million additional, on top of the existing pandemic, additional gender-based violence cases were, were expected. And they said that for every three months, the lockdown continues an additional 15 million uh, additional cases can be expected. And this is global. Um, again, why? It's, it's a mix of things. It's the stress. It's the crisis. It's being uh, pushed up together in, in, a, in a limited space, not being able to escape, women can't go to work. In, in many cases, the victim or the perpetrator isn't going to work or getting out and socializing and going into other social settings where they can be safer or get support. There's just a million reasons why we can expect family violence to increase at this time. And that seems to be what we're seeing. Next one, Michelle. So uh, compounding the problem is that <laughs> Uh, battered women's shelters in particular. Not Most women don't go to shelters, but obviously those in the most danger do, uh, or many of them do. And um, unfortunately, because of COVID, some shelters are having to restrict entry or closing um, altogether. Now, there's one shelter in Nashville that was able to get RVs, trailers, to house uh, victims in. I don't know how many shelters are able to uh, generate that kind of a program. So I was saying some shelters are using hotel rooms. I'm not sure where they're getting the funding, but a lot of shelters don't have extra funding to do that kind of thing. And uh, in some proactive countries like New Zealand, Germany, Italy, and Spain, uh, the governments took the initiative and realized that domestic violence was going to be a huge um, effect of the pandemic and the quarantine and started immediately getting uh, new resources up for housing and getting dollars or funds out to programs. Um, the UK promised 46 million to its DV programs, but as of July 2, according to the New York Times, only 1 million had been received. And the US, it's really sad when you start looking globally at responses to violence against women. The US hasn't even had this conversation. Um, it is really interesting to me that uh, even our leading national lobbying groups have not really pressed for this issue for increased funding in the, in the, in the programs that the US administration has been starting to address and to fund. Um, I don't know where we are. I think in the, in the next round, I'm not sure whether DV is even on the table. I think one reason may just be that programs are so overwhelmed dealing with the situation, but, but a lot of these national leading groups are not direct service providers, and I don't know exactly what their excuse is for not getting this on the table, but uh, we really should be. Um, next slide, Michelle. The other um, sort of consequence of the, of the pandemic is that it, courts are extremely difficult to access now. Many courts have been closed. Some of them over the last couple of months have started to get up and running uh, with remote hearings. I know that in DC, there have been some remote custody hearings. Um, there, the domestic violence unit was more or less closed. They did start doing some remote hearings for ex parte orders. I don't know if they're doing contested trials yet. 
Um, what they did do instead was issue an order um, that all existing protection orders are extended until a further date. And then when the date arrives, they extend them more. So they're basically trying to keep people out of the court. But as far as those that need full hearings, I'm not even sure if those are up and running yet in DC. And DC is actually very, one of the strongest, most proactive domestic violence communities, very well uh, affiliated with the courts. And um, uh, they've done a great job of developing remote protection order filings and, and, and helping the court figure out how to receive those. Uh, but even so, I think there's a really limited access. And of course, there are many delays because courts are um, postponing, postponing until perhaps the day comes when they reopen more fully. Uh, I do think they're starting to adjust like we all are to the reality that this may go on for a good long time and we have to figure out how we are handling legal cases in, in the world where we don't all come together. But it's taking some time. Next slide, Michelle. Thank you. Um, so here's my second topic, um, and that is really about what happens when parents are co-parenting and one is a perpetrator and one is a victim. Um, obviously, when courts award shared parenting or joint custody or even just uh, generous visitation time to a parent, they are doing so on the premise that they have con concluded that that parent isn't necessarily dangerous to the children. Um, but in many cases, and this is where my research comes in, but I'm not going to take the time today to talk about it. What we know is that many, many, many uh, courts are refusing to acknowledge abuse when it is raised by a mother in court in a custody battle. And whether that is adult partner violence or child abuse, the courts are very reluctant to either acknowledge it or to rule accordingly to, to issue protective custody orders in that context. And we're seeing that they're particularly reluctant to take seriously child abuse claims, uh, which is something I can talk more about some other day. But um, so we know, and I know anecdotally from cases I've received and reviewed and from talking to colleagues around the country, we know that many battered women and many abused children are being forced to see parents who are not safe for them. On, either as shared custody or as a visitation order. And unfortunately, uh, many women who are victims have lost custody to an abuser before COVID hit. So what you have is a situation where some perpetrators, mostly fathers, are weaponizing COVID um, and saying, I'm not gonna let you see the children until this is over or until you quit your job or whatever. This is being used in particular against women who are on the front lines, either in the health professions or in another essential a work role. Um, interestingly and consistent with my research, there have been a few women who have tried to do the reverse, tried to restrict a father's access. This is purely anecdotal and in no way statistically meaningful, but the, the cases I know about, the women did not succeed in getting that restriction from the court, whereas I do know a couple of cases where fathers did succeed in getting the court to agree that they could restrict access to the mother for a while. The one case I'm thinking of, the court finally, after like a month or six weeks, reversed itself and suddenly realized this was not a short-term emergency and you can't withhold children from a parent indefinitely under these circumstances. Um, of course, uh, when someone violates a court order and, and parenting access, it's very, very hard to get enforcement of an order now. Um, in fact, um, uh, many courts are not even open for that purpose. They're only open for emergency hearings. And I guess in many cases, enforcement of parenting time may not be seen as an emergency, although it could be framed as one. Um, and um, th then the last point I think I already addressed, which is that, you know, some people are just uh, using self-help and withholding the children from the other parent. Um, and it's very hard to get that fixed now. Other people are file filing with the court and saying, dear court, please cut off her access because of COVID and courts are either granting or denying those petitions. My guess is that that's being done in a gendered way consistent with my prior research, which is showing extreme gender bias in the ways courts respond to parenting requests and respond to abuse claims. But we don't know because we don't have enough data right now about the gender contours of what's happening during COVID. Um, Michelle, thank you. Next slide. So, and this is, this is kind of ironic. Um, I, I really kind of love this. Um, in the beginning, there were all these um, guidelines, guidance that was issued by groups like the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts. And the guidance was something like this. Grow up, work together, take care of your kids together. 
And they were saying this to divorced parents, in many cases, abusers and victims. And um, some courts have actually issued guidance from the courts themselves saying, you just have to cooperate with each other, which is, you know, that's fine if you have two people who are able to put the children's interests ahead of their own, but you have a lot of either pathological or manipulative or abusive parents in these cases, and they are not interested in doing the right thing for the kids or for the other parent. So um, other courts have uh, begun to issue kind of guidance that says you have to follow existing orders until they're modified by a court. Mind you, we can't get court modifications right now. Um, and so um, it, uh, you're stuck with the order for better or for worse. And depending on which side of that order you're on, whether you like it or not, that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I showed, I used the picture of the fist just to point out that telling parents to cooperate with each other is really silly when you're talking about one person being an abuser. Um, so courts have been interestingly kind of MIA a little bit in response to the, to the realities of abuse here. They, as always, they treat family law as though it's not about abuse. It's just about parents who divorced and can't get along. Uh, and they're just not recognizing that 75% of those cases are have a history of domestic violence. Last one, I think, uh, Michelle. Uh, so, so I'm ending here with um, just a few thoughts about you know the work ahead. Obviously, the immediate work ahead is that we need to get the courts more open and more accessible so that they can hear parenting cases and domestic violence cases, of course. Nationally, I think we should be pressing in a way that I'm not sure we have for serious funding um, in any future programs that get authorized by Congress, funding for DV services that respond to the quarantine, and then lastly, the gender equity work needs to continue. It's, been, it's already started, but it needs to continue, and hopefully we can roll what we learn about COVID into it. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Professor Meyer. This has been um, an, a great introduction to the topic. I very much appreciate your reminding us that while the incidents or the events are going up, the provision of services is going down at the same time, both in terms of support services and in terms of court availability. And then your um, right at the end, the issues around parenting and, and how to manage that. They raise so many ethical issues around uh, benefits and for whose benefit and indeed, uh, uh, issues of equity and justice, which we will come back to. Thank you very much for that introduction. My pleasure. I'm really excited to welcome uh, Dr. Nicole Lang. Uh, Dr. Lang is a board certified pediatrician. She's got decades of experience in caring for children, particularly right here in our local communities. Uh, she's also founder of the Washington Pediatric Associates and uh, really has specialized in looking at uh, uh, pediatric care, but more importantly, has had a very strong uh, affiliation with our uh, the GW School of Medicine and indeed uh, with her expertise in adolescent med medicine. So she's got a, a lot of experience with training and specializes in looking at particularly these issues around uh, the impact on children. So uh, uh, Dr. Lang, looking forward to hearing your opening reflections. Over to you. Thank you very much, first of all, for having me. And uh, thank you, Joan. Um, I appreciate that we're doing this together. And I just wanted to uh, start out by saying, uh, Michelle, if you wouldn't mind just going to the next slide. Thank you. I just wanted to start out by saying as a pediatrician, um, my job and my fellow pediatrician's job is to not only care for the child and the family, but to look at the child in the context of the family and to see what support can be offered to parents. Uh, and I think the um, parenting in general is a challenge and it's even more of a challenge during a pandemic. And um, as I've listed here uh, and what Joan has said, uh, families are under a lot of stress and when that happens, there is a risk uh, for child abuse and neglect. Um, and just to give just a few statistics, um, approximately 3 million cases of child abuse and neglect um, are reported, and that involves about 5.5 million children each year. Uh, the CDC reports that at least one in seven children have experienced child abuse or neglect in the past year. And in 2018, nearly 1,770 children have died of abuse and neglect in the United States. Uh, so this is an ongoing uh, issue that uh, really pediatricians are uh, mandatory reporters, uh, along with uh, teachers and anyone that is involved in the child's life that may be suspicious. And given a pandemic, 
when children are not in school, um, what we have seen is that there has been a decrease in the reporting of child abuse. And what um, we are seeing is that I've talked to several pediatric ER doctors and of that nature, and there is an increase in the severity of children presenting to the emergency room with child abuse um, cases. Uh, for example, um, with uh, brain injury and uh, even death. So uh, even though the reporting is down because there are less people available to survey the children, uh, when they are presenting for medical attention, it is a more severe case of child abuse and neglect. And so just some of the risk factors involved include parental isolation or stress or frustration and we're seeing all of that escalated during this pandemic. Uh, again, domestic violence in the household, that's going to be a risk factor. And parents suffering from mental health issues, for example, depression or substance abuse. And as an aside, we in my practice, we screen new moms for postpartum depression. Uh, and if you can pick up on that early on, that can sometimes help uh, circumvent uh, abuse. Uh, and parents with history of child abuse themselves, you can see the cycle um, repeating itself. And those families living with financial hardship. And in this pandemic, when people are losing their jobs and have very uncertain uh, futures from day to day, uh, the stress level will increase and therefore there is a risk for parents to take out their frustration on their children. And the types of abuse that we see are emotional abuse, physical, sexual, and neglect. Uh, there are some studies that involve long-term effects of what we call toxic stress, and that's the ACE study or the Ad Adverse Childhood Experiences that uh, was done by the Kaiser Foundation and the CDC, and that looked like a, it was a longitudinal study that looked at the effects of adverse childhood experiences, primarily including domestic violence and uh, different forms of child abuse, and looking to see that if children were exposed to that early on, later on it has a traumatic impact on their physical, mental, and uh, just overall well-being. And it also can affect their um, just health in general. Uh, but there are protective factors, we'll talk about that uh, in just a few moments, uh, that can help circumvent or buffer the toxic stress that a child is going through, and also just building resilience in general uh, will help uh, children long term with their overall health and emotional well being. Michelle, next slide, please. Uh, and I alluded to this uh, just a second ago, that most of the reporting that goes on with child abuse does come from doctors. Uh, and again, the doctor visits have been down because parents are scared to come out uh, in fear of being exposed to the COVID virus. And so uh, we are actually, and pediatricians across the nation are actually reaching out and calling families to come in for their well child visits, for their vaccination visits, because we've seen a drop in immunizations while this uh, pandemic has been going on. And so when a child is in the doctor's office, there are subtle signs and uh, red flags that we would notice, but if they're not coming in, we're not able to uh, discern that. Uh, and again, teachers and counselors, mental health professionals in general that we're seeing the children, uh, if they're not seeing them uh, day to day, uh, they're going to miss certain uh, red flags. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, again, I mentioned this, less cases are being reported, but they're presenting with more severe uh, illness. And in March, this is just a very startling statistic I read. Uh, for the first time ever, half of the national sexual assault hotline callers were minors, and 79% said they were living with their abuser. So this is very, very scary, and um, children are living in a constant state of fear. And so when this is happening, just physiologically, when a child is exposed to a constant state of stress, their fight or flight response and releasing of stress hormones is going on on a constant basis. That has long-term detrimental effects on their overall brain development and their overall health and well-being. And they can eventually have long-term effects on cardiovascular health, lung health, et cetera. Next slide, please. So there are some preventive measures that can be put in place. Uh, Joan mentioned some of these as well. 
uh, but strengthening economic support for families, uh, changing uh, social norms to support parents and positive parenting. Again, giving parents strategies and tips on, for example, how to calm a fussy baby, a baby that's crying, that's their way of communicating. But if a parent is already stressed, sleep deprived and worried about the effects of the pandemic, they're gonna have less uh, reserve, if you will, in order to calm the baby. And so they may uh, inadvertently abuse the child um, because they don't have the strategies or skills or support in place to try different things to um, use more positive approaches. Uh, other measures could include providing quality care and education and early in life um, with child care centers being closed. That's, you know, another concern. Um, and we mentioned about parenting skills and uh, just lessening the harm uh, and preventing future risk by having uh, family health resources better funded or community centers better funded. And also uh, there's a, a real need for mental health professionals and psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, school counselors to help uh, with uh, mental health effects um, for the children involved. Next slide. So some of the solutions uh, that I just wanted to broadly talk about was just prevention, uh, figuring out how we can help prevent uh, abuse from happening, educating those around the children for signs and symptoms of abuse and neglect, and then advocating for our policies to have more uh, of a focus on putting children as a priority. Um, one of the advocacy groups I've been involved with in the past is Every Child Matters, and uh, we focused on making children a national um, priority uh, regardless. Um, so what people can do in general is to offer support for parents, give them strategies on how to deal with um, just stress in general. Um, and what educators have uh, done when things went virtual to learning is really checking in with students via email or one-on-one -on -one or some uh, teachers were having homework assignments that asked a question that was embedded in their homework of how are they feeling and trying to see if there's any red flags that come up um, without being very obvious to parents that may be overlooking what they're doing. Um, but again, the biggest thing that I want to uh, stress is just the need for support around the families. Um, because we're physically distancing doesn't mean that um, we have to be socially distancing. We have to stay connected. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are just a list of hotlines and resources that I just wanted to mention. Um, and these will be available uh, afterwards, but these are very important just to know that there is help available for parents and for children. Uh, and the last one, um, just regarding the pandemic that I recommend my patients to go to is the cdc.gov uh, website to give them guidance on how to stay safe during the pandemic too. And wearing masks is important. Next slide. Um, so the take home messages, again, physically distancing ourselves because we're in the pandemic is important in order to stay safe, but we have to maintain our social connections uh, with our families uh, and especially those that are most at risk to try to prevent uh, child abuse and neglect. So thank you. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Lang, for that um, <clears throat> reminder to us about um, child abuse, about the risk that children face during this pandemic, uh, not related to the pandemic, but associated with it, uh, particularly the, your, your um, perceptions of toxic stress and chronic stress and the implications for that for growth, and, uh, and the stark reality that you present also in terms of uh, sexual violence, not just physical violence. And that's uh, a very, very important reminder. And, and I want to come back to this. So ladies and gentlemen, what you've seen is a reminder to us about this enormous public health burden that has now become even more acute. And while my colleagues have done uh, uh, both from a legal response perspective, from a clinical pediatric perspective, um, I recognize there are many other perspectives and I hope that for those of you who are interested, put your reflections, put your comments in the chat board and we'll make sure that we try and get to them. So Joan, maybe I can start with you. Um, and, and because you were talking about um, 
this the complexity. I want to go a little bit more into complexity and then I'll come out and talk about measures. So I want to respond to a, some of the comments related to this notion of immigration. Uh, not only is it children and women, not only uh, I want to talk to you a little, I want you to talk a little bit more about the intersectionality of the fact that these same individuals might be minorities, they might be uh, vulnerable from multiple perspectives, including immigration, and, and uh, comments around that, how that plays into, into responding to this. Oh my. Um, I'm not sure I have a lot of light to shed on that. I mean, it, you are right that, that immigrant women face a, a kind of a unique set of challenges on top of the generic set of challenges that battered women have. And there's a wonderful project called the National Im Immigrant Women's Project or Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project at American University run by Leslie Orla that specializes in that and develops policy and supports service givers. So, I mean, <laughs> I think the problems are the same, only worse. I mean, they're, they're, they're more isolated already before COVID hits. Um, they have fewer options already before COVID hits because of potentially not being legal. Um, and, um, and now if the, I don't, what I don't know right now is what's happening with immigration hearings, hearings on green cards or um, citizenship or asylum or anything else. But my bet is that it's the same as the courts, that there's a lot of shutdown that's happened. I don't know if others on this call know more. Yep, um, yep. But so I'm guessing that that compounds everything. Um, I will say that uh, Leslie Orloff was on, uh, both of us were appointed to the New York task force on COVID-19 and domestic violence. And that task force, uh, was a great venue for really creative ideas. And some of the ideas that Leslie put out around connecting, uh, remotely connecting providers and uh, survivors were very interesting and taken quite seriously. But I, you know, I can't tell you exactly what's happening. No, thank you very much, Joan. And, and just on that complexity framework, Nicole, what about kids who also belong not only, again, to those, to those groups that I just mentioned for Joan, but also who may be disabled? How does uh, disabled children and women. How does that cause further complications in this in the picture that we are trying to paint here? Uh, I think you're on mute, Joan. I mean, Nicole. Sorry. Um, let me make sure. Oh, you you got it, and then it went back again. Could I ask everybody else to be on mute? Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself, Nicole. That would be... Okay, there uh, we go. And, and maybe you just want to stay on mute, so okay. <laughs> you can be quiet. But, uh, go ahead, please. Okay, yes. No, no. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, no, I think that that is a unique sit situation as well with children with disabilities uh, because they already have um, a lot of extra support that is needed. And if they can't, for example, get the services that they normally would get, for example, with physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, or um, just uh, behavioral therapy, then they are going to um, be more at a disadvantage. They may not be developing along as they should with the extra supports that they have. And so there will be wider gaps and a lot of catch up time that'll be needed when things do start to open up because uh, many parents have told me it's very difficult virtual visits and not everyone even has access to uh, the internet to do virtual visits. So a lot of things we're making assumptions on with regard to um, what families can and cannot do uh, virtually or versus in-person visits. And some have transportation issues or just in addition, uh, just the basic needs of being met of uh, food insecurity and housing insecurity with this pandemic. So there's many food banks that have been uh, providing a lot of uh, support for families that didn't have this. But yes, children with special needs definitely are at an increased risk uh, of uh, needing more support during this time. No, this is very important. And I think we, in, in many of our webinars, we have been recognizing the intersectionality of all of these issues and how they play upon often the same individuals, unfortunately. So Joan, what, what can um, services do? What types of resources should they be providing right now? 
um, because there is an ethical mandate to help, even though, uh, as, as Nicole mentioned, they may not be able to do it physically. You gave one example of an organization that had the capacity to have vehicles that would go to, into communities, but not everybody can have the resource. So could you give some examples or some ideas or your thoughts around that? So well, I was just reading another uh, report on a rape crisis center, which was apparently housed in, a, in a, some kind of a health center where they felt that there was a risk. So they moved them out of there, but they also moved with them a bunch of beds and um, other uh, support, office support materials. And so they started, instead of housing some of their survivors in that site they started, or, or in their usual shelter program, they started housing them in their headquarters. I mean, that's the kind of thing people are doing to try to manage the pandemic, um, and the health concerns along with the safety and recovery and trauma concerns. Um, I think ingenuity is, you know, it, it's the great thing about, about the, human, the human species is that the ingenuity is boundless. And so people do come up with, with ideas, but I have to say, listening to Michelle and thinking about tele, telehealth, which has been so important for so many people, um, and telecounseling and, and support, um, we, it seems to me a huge priority for the government needs to be to get internet to everyone in this country mm -hmm. and to get computers to everyone in this country. I mean, I have a former client family whose children, when they went into quarantine, were trying to do their homework and their classes on their phones. And just the thought of that makes me dizzy. It's just, it's unimaginable and it's crazy. You know, we're in a world now where I think remote access is going to be uh, continuing to, uh, to be a great need, even after we have a vaccine, even after more people are back to normal, quote unquote. I think remote, I think the new, brave new world is going to be much more remote than it has been before. And the, the public policy has to, has to understand that. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't ask service providers to supply internet service. They don't have the funding. Um, but you know, they are moving around. They're moving their services around. They are definitely all reaching out online in every way they can. Um, and I think, I think we all need to be coming together to, to push very hard, the federal government, for the resources to expand all of that. I think the interesting thing, Joan, just at that last point, is that the inequity in access with respect to internet, um, I, in my global health work over the past uh, two and a half decades, have talked about it from a global perspective between high and low and middle income countries. But what we have realized due to this pandemic is that's a huge issue within this country as well, where you have uh, folks in Washington, D.C., where um, that have all types of internet uh, uh, banned services and others who barely survive. Um, and I think this is a huge issue. So, so Nicole, building on that, um, what do we do then in terms of, uh, in terms of reporting, an issue mm. both of you have raised, um, particularly if schools remain closed? What, what happens? Because school is often where uh, other uh, teachers often pick up these type of signs. But if we remain online and if we remain uh, what are your concerns around reporting of, of child abuse and family violence? Right. No, I have many concerns about that. Um, and I am uh, conflicted about putting children back into school when it's still, the virus is not contained. It's not 100% safe. I'm telling my families to keep checking back with the CDC guidelines on that. Um, but it is a concern on the other hand of uh, we're missing child abuse cases. We're not able to report them. Uh, so some teachers are becoming very creative as Joan was saying, we're uh, use our um, creativity and trying to reach out to students um, via email or chat rooms or different ways of uh, the school counselors reaching out one-on-one. -on -one. I think there needs to be an increase in school counselors in order to reach children uh, to check in with them. Uh, there's also some uh, discussion of on their online learning platforms to have a self-reporting um, uh, um, apparatus that they could log into and report themselves, just as those children that reported the sexual abuse um, by calling in, um, there are some on the development of some online platforms being uh, created. But again, it's not universal yet. It's in the beginning stages of that. 
And so I think it really goes back to having a multidisciplinary approach of having doctors and teachers and psychologists and lawyers and public health experts all work together to figure out how can we best support families, number one, uh, so that the risk of child abuse isn't elevated with the stress level going up. How can we minimize the stress and give families what they need? But two, if they are in a dangerous situation, um, how can they feel comfortable, you know, coming in and, um, and making sure we can identify those particular cases. And so pediatricians are reaching out and having discussions with families. Um, and I'm, and the biggest question I'm asking, you know, children and the parents together and separately is how are you handling the stress? How are you dealing with the stress? What support do you need? Uh, and so I think it's a big burden that should be placed on the pediatrician too, to make sure that you're going the extra effort, to go in that extra mile, to see what we can do to support families and then connect the dots to them to get the resources that they need. Because uh, home visitation is another program that has been done in the past. But again, with COVID, uh, that's not happening, uh, except for in extreme circumstances. So I think um, we have to keep finding ways and keep searching out ways to best support families, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And I think those are great points. Faith-based faith -based organizations, too, are being a big help, too, I think, in reaching out. Uh, for families too. And frankly, these are, um, Nicole, one of the points, I just want to, and I'm, I'm going to go to Joan because she wants to come in on this. I'm going to highlight something, particularly for those of my colleagues online right now, who may be from other countries, that this is where we can learn from the developing world. Because guess what? Community health workers and getting out into the homes is the norm of many of those yeah. health systems. Yeah. And, and their ability to use, I mean, the cell phone has been the device for health and the economy in many, many low middle income countries. Not so right here in high income countries like the US. So I think we have to be open to that learning, Nicole, as you, as you point out. So over to you, Joan, for coming in on this point. I just wanted to say uh, two things. One is that there, uh, there's a wonderful organization called the Safe and Together Institute run by David Mandel. Uh, he works with child welfare agencies all over the world. Um, and he's been doing all kinds of great webinars. And one of them was on how to be a social worker um, how to do child visits um, through the internet. And so, so there, that kind of innovation is happening. Of course, your family has to have the internet for that. The other thing I wanted to say is that reporting is barely a solution because what happens when something's reported to child welfare is often not very good. Um, and particularly where the parents are the loggerheads over custody, child welfare tends to take a hands-off uh, stance in those cases and just think either the judge will deal with it or it's just a strategy, it's not real. And so we really have to work on getting the systems to take child abuse reports seriously, whether or not there's a custody battle or a division between the parents, um, and to uh, shed a lot of these pre-misconceptions pre about it. Um, because otherwise we'll just be, we'll be doing great on reporting, but we'll be doing nothing, nothing good for children. <laughs> but Joan, while I have you, then what about, um, to building off from Nicole said, could we train the lawyers and the uh, other professionals who are out there maybe having the opportunity to interact with families increasingly to be trained to detect such things? Uh, one, of our, uh, one of our participants has been uh, asking uh, about how do you train other professionals? And in, in addition to the use of technology, which I think Nicole has given some great examples of how the, the noodles and the naviances of the world can have buttons and and I'm sure there are apps that can be developed, but any thought on training other professionals? Oh, I do a lot. I do, well, I do a lot of training of judges and psychologists and advocates and occasionally child welfare, social work type people. So, I mean, I do that regularly around what not to believe and what to, you know, how to recognize your misconceptions and what not to think about when, you, when you're inclined to think something's not true, why you why these things don't actually indicate it's not true. And uh, some of the theories like parental alienation that are used to deny child abuse. Um, so I do a lot of that kind of training and there are others who do as well. Um, but I like very much the idea of partnering with community health and uh, public health uh, professionals. And you know, in the olden days, uh, in, the, in the civil rights days, there were, um, they invented programs where they had uh, lawyers uh, stationed in hospitals um, doing what they called like a legal 360 to assess 
what legal needs you have as well as what health needs you have. And that kind of model may be something that we need to get back to and build out. No, great thoughts. And actually, in many countries, there is something called the medical legal officer who's often uh, present in the hospital. Unfortunately, most of them refer to a purely legal enterprise. That is, if there's a police case, a murder case, an assault case, then that's when they get involved. Uh, and sometimes the experiences are not very positive. And these individuals often aren't, um, aren't promoting the victim as much as they are enforcing an enforcement of the law. But I think that that's great. So, so Nicole, another thought that's come up on the, on the board is that sometimes you do identify families that need help. You can see them, and I'm sure you, in your vast experience, but they don't somehow want to accept help. What happens when you can see that one uh, child needs help, but the mother doesn't realize, or the mother wants to, but the father doesn't, and so on? How do you get, um, what should we do right now in terms of uh, discordant uh, 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 you know, and disagreements, uh, particularly if we are doing remote work? Right. Well, um, I think the number one thing is to be a good listener and to figure out what is the core underlying issue and the resistance of getting the help and figuring out what are the preconceived ideas that are going on in the family's mind. And maybe the higher priority is getting food because they're uh, living in poverty and they're hungry. Okay, so you have to prioritize what their needs are. And so maybe their need to get a certain resource in mental health is lower on the priority list than the basic food and shelter because they're about to be evicted or something of that nature. So I think it really looks at listening to what each individual in the family is able to verbalize and to express their concern and not to always make the assumption that you know what's best for the family. Um, so a lot of times um, partnering with the family, uh, helping to encourage and to strengthen their um, parenting skills, because one of my uh, great mentors, Dr. T. Barry Basilton, always told me, two parents come into the, your office with two questions. How am I doing as a parent and how is my child doing? And so uh, you have to take a step back and not think that you have all the answers, number one, and to m meet families midway and to partner with them and to figure out how to best address the issues. And you may not address every issue at that one particular visit, but it includes follow-up, whether it's phone or uh, letter or visits or making sure if you didn't have them to make a refer, you know, ask them to connect with a certain referral system uh, to make, to follow up and see if they did it, if they had time to do it, or if I could help and facilitate to make that appointment for them. I have done that too. So it's just a matter of what are the needs according to the family's perspective, and then what are the resources that you can connect them with, and then what you, once they build that trust with you, I think that's the underlying foundation. Once they have the trust built with you, then they will better heed to your recommendations on other issues that you may see that uh, could be problematic down the road. And so um, that would be one of the things that I would think about. No, yeah. thank you very much. That's a very reasoned approach and very much value the words of your mentor. So, so Joan, as we begin to sort of wind down, concerned about some of the comments like um, Gerald and Susan have posted on the chat board around that we actually know things. We even have data on things. And yet to change policy has been so difficult. And with, without myself making a political statement in the current administration, to be, to be frank and honest, because I'm a pessimistic, but how? How do we change this with respect to family and domestic violence? How do we you know, uh, make sure that we have a big policy win, followed by what you said, which is funding flows on your slides to make it happen. Uh, some reflections on that. Well, that's a huge question, but I will, I will say one thing. I know. Um, and Hina asked earlier, what can we get out of this pandemic that we might want to continue in the future? And I think, you know, the combination of the racial justice paradigm shift that we're going through and the pandemic and the racial implications of that and racial and other diversity implications. Um, the implications in terms of poverty and lack of resources and lack of internet and, you know, all of these things are being spotlighted now. And my hope is that the, the communities that see them and care about them, like, you know, especially, I, I could see pediatricians maybe partnering with public health 
professionals kind of spearheading a movement around these needs that families have that would, that if we address them would reduce ACEs would re reduce adverse childhood experiences, and it's time that we, you know, that we did this. And using the pandemic to shine a light on that might, you know, in a new administration, might actually uh, get serious attention and um, get dealt with. I was also thinking that uh, when I said that I would love, as lawyer, to, you know, that I think we as advocates should be should be partnering with public health, we should be partnering in particular with pediatricians, because listening to Nicole talk about that in, inside view with the family and that partnership with the family, that is where we need to be. And we need the pediatricians to be partnering with us to speak out about what's going wrong in courts, because it's not just women who don't see things clearly or have other priorities. It's women fighting for safety of their kids and being smashed in court. And so, you know, there are many women who are very clear about what needs to happen for the safety of their family and the courts aren't allowing it and they're punishing that. So, if, so I'm hoping and I'm starting to work on bringing pediatricians officially, hopefully, into, an, into a collaborative network. And I'm hoping Nicole will help me with that to, to uh, uh, raise awareness at both publicly and among lawmakers about this problem. Absolutely. And I think that, I'm sorry. I think, um, uh, I think, I think, uh, the, the legal, clinical, medical, public health communities need to work together on this. Nicole, I do want you to come on this point because it's a very big point, as it's a very big question, as Joan said. And as you reflect on this point, add a little bit about how to empower children in this process, because I think we sometimes forget about their agency. And it would be great to, if you could respond to this question, but also add that. Right. So, uh, Two things, I'll just back up a second. Uh, Joan and I first met years ago after I finished residency uh, because I, I attended, first of all, GW for medical school, but Emory for residency. While I was a resident at Emory, I actually created a child advocacy program involving the medical school, law school, and public health school. And then I, once I came to GW to work, I wanted to replicate that same program of how the three different silos that normally don't speak together are working together for child advocacy issues. One issue was child abuse uh, at Emory and another one was like gun violence, et cetera. So I was excited to join forces with Joan when I first came to GW or came back to GW um, as a attending position. And uh, we have talked in the past and worked together in the past. So I'm very excited today about the fact that the medical school, public health and law school of GW is forming together uh, this conversation and how we can potentially work together in the future to uh, address issues around children because they are the ones without the voice. They cannot vote they, <laughs> until they're 18. And so we have to be the advocate and the voice for them. And so, but we can encourage them. And I'm actually quite uh, inspired by what I'm seeing um, from talking to my patients and what I'm seeing and just the um, Black Lives Matter protests that are uh, happening, that children are really making the shift and pushing and driving force the change that is needed in order to address many inequities uh, that we're seeing that have come out of the COVID pandemic and um, from healthcare disparities uh, and the like. So I think that um, it's very important to and keep empowering children, to keep telling them that their voice does matter and to speak up uh, and to make a difference because uh, the, the children really are the future. That is cliche-ish, but it's true. And we have to support them in order for the positive paradigm shift to happen. I think both of you are, are right spot on. I think this is a time where, you know, we can think about it uh, pessimistically and say, wow, we have multiple problems now uh, coming on top of us. But if we, if we have the energy and the vision to ride on the wave of discontent that is now going on, which is to say there are actually multiple pandemics. And as um, folks in the chat board are recognizing, that uh, many, many things that have been going on for hundreds of years are being now um, not just uncovered, but being, uh, being rephrased in a different way, with more energy, uh, with the voice of particularly young people who I believe want to have a change and want to have a real and long-lasting impact. Um, I think, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what you've seen in this conversation really is, first of all, uh, the importance of the public health dimensions of domestic violence, family violence, child abuse, uh, intimate partner violence, uh, many of those things that uh, many of you may have looked at from a medical or from a legal or from a public health viewpoint. 
But I think what is excessively important to remember is that we are talking about um, the perspective of uh, human rights. We are talking about the perspective of ethics. We are trying to say that it is absolutely important and we have a moral imperative to continue to provide services for those who are vulnerable in our communities. Um, and unfortunately, those who are being affected by this pandemic and by racism may also be the ones who are being affected by issues of domestic and family violence. So our panelists today have, are forcing us to think in those directions. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for the perspectives they present. I wanna make sure that everyone is aware that um, if you are a student and you need your professional education forms, uh, Michelle has put on the website and the email where you can submit that. Uh, also that this webinar um, is recorded and we will be posting that on the School of Public Health YouTube website. Um, for those of you who may have colleagues or if you want to have a refresher uh, with the wonderful slides, that I want to thank both Professors Meyer and uh, Lang for joining us today. Uh, this was a great insight into an important issue which is relevant not only here, right here in Washington DC where some of us operate and in the country that we live in, which is the United States, but also globally. And I wanna go back to what you started with, Joan. You talked about the over 30 million potential uh, incidents that may happen over a six month time period. That according to my math is 5 million a month. That is unacceptable. That is just surely a volume that I think uh, whether you are a clinician, whether you're a sociologist, whether you are a lawyer, uh, I think we have to work together uh, to make this um, happen in a way that we can prevent those incidences. And when we cannot prevent them, at least mitigate and help uh, with their impact. So thank you all for joining. Please remember in two weeks time on the 4th of August is our next webinar, where we'll be talking about the ethics around confidentiality and privacy of digital media. Uh, a lot of electronic means and digital media being used now during COVID. And we've got a wonderful panel uh, to discuss that with you. Uh, so until two Tuesdays from now, thank you again, Joan and Nicole, and goodbye to all. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Goodbye.